Hello again. Um, I'd like to welcome you to session three, producing Holocaust testimonies, perspective from interviewers and interviewees. And um, I think it fits very well uh, as the session following the last session, because really what we're going to discuss are many issues touched in session two about agency, authorship, uh, you know, and what creates, what makes an interview. So I'd like to welcome Eva Clark, who is lost at the moment. I don't know where she is, um, but I hope she'll come back soon. Um, Jackie Young and Kurt Marx and Natasha Kaplinsky and Rosalind Lifshin to this panel on the theme of producing Holocaust testimonies, perspective from interviewers and interviewees. Natasha Kaplinsky will be known to many of you. She is a newsreader, TV presenter, and activist and businesswoman who has worked with various networks, including Sky, TV, Sky News, BBC News, Channel 5, and ITV News. She's also an ambassador for Save the Children and involved with many other charities. Dr. Rosalind Lifshin is an oral historian and research consultant and oral history trainer for the British Library and Oral History Society, training groups in the Northwest in the practice of oral history. But most importantly, for our purposes, is that she has conducted over 70 interviews for Refugee Voices. And this is in the time from in the first phase of the project from 2003 to 2008. Jackie Young and Eva Clark are child survivors from Vienna and from Prague. And here is Eva Clark. Please take a seat. <laughs> Kurt Marx came on the kinder transport from Cologne as a 13-year-old boy. You can find out more about their lives on the online biographies. I apologize, I'm never late, but needs must. <laughs> you're, you're excused, Eva, it's fine. Um, so you can find out more about their lives on the online biographies, but also on the Refugee Voices website. Some of you might have heard Jackie's story as he appeared on BBC's DNA Family Secrets, um, and Jackie was also guest of honor at this year's Simon Wiesenthal prize giving ceremony in Vienna. Eva Clark was uh, just last week been awarded the freedom of the county borough of Blano Gwent, if I pronounce this pr uh, correctly, in South Wales. And Kurt Marx recently met uh, Bärbel Bass, the German president of the Bundestag, when she visited the Kindertransport Memorial at Liverpool Street Station last month. Thank you all for joining us on this panel. We've just heard uh, in the paper from Professor Tony Kushner who addressed the question if testimonies are given or taken. The renowned oral historian and literature professor Alessandro Potelli talks about the oral history interviews as, quote, an exchange of gazes and co-created narratives between subjects, the interviewer and the interviewee. So if we see testimony as a co-creation like Potelli, the background, life experiences, and the approach of the interviewer matters a great deal. So I wanted to first turn to both Natasha and Rosalind. Um, Natasha was invited by the then Prime Minister David Cameron to join the Holocaust Commission in 2014 and subsequently conducted 112 interviews for the foundation between 2015 and 2016. So I wanted to start with you, Natasha, and ask you what brought you to interviewing Holocaust survivor? What is your personal connection to the topic? Um, and I know that in your case, the program, Who Do You Think You Are, played an important part, so please tell us more. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm an amateur. I need to press the button, don't I? Uh, may I... Um, Is this working? Is it working? No. Work experience. No. Should I just shout? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to start... Um, uh, before answering that question, to thank uh, AJR, the Foreign Office, and everybody involved for convening us today. Uh, it feels very special to be um, on this panel, so thank you, Bayer, as well. Um, I haven't had a chance to see too many of the uh, fellow attendees, but I have seen a few of the Holocaust survivors who I have met and have brought me to this panel. And I just wanted to say how humbled I always am when I, when I meet you. And this is about you today. And I hope you can feel the love and admiration for the survivors in this room. So I wanted to start by saying that. Thank you. 
And then to answer Bear's question, yes, indeed, it started with an email which I thought was a fake email from uh, number 10 and just deleted it, thinking, oh, that doesn't look like anything um, special. But actually, it turned out to be an email from um, one of David Cameron's team when he was uh, the Prime Minister uh, setting up a Holocaust commission. Uh, I was very honoured to be part of that commission, and I believe that I'd come to his attention because of the BBC programme, Who Do You Think You Are?, which uncovered my father's story uh, where I went to Belarus uh, with a photograph, not knowing who they were and basically having uh, uh, my heart broken along with everybody else in our family uh, to understand what had happened to that part of our family. So um, when David Cameron was setting up a Holocaust commission, I was so honoured to be part of, of that commission. We took a year to go around the world to interview lots of different people to find out what this country needed to do better. And a year later, we wrote a report. All of the recommendations were uh, accepted, including the establishment of a Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre, more of which later on, um, and also the urgency of recording some survivor testimony. Uh, since I was the only journalist on that commission, I put my hand up and said, let me start by um, interviewing five survivors and let's see how it goes. And it was such an extraordinary experience. It was such an exchange of emotions. It was such a liberating experience for the survivors. And it felt so important that those five interviews turned into 112, which spanned 15 months or so. Um, and for me personally, it was a huge honor. The chief rabbi at the time said it was a sacred task and it definitely felt like a sacred task. Uh, but for me personally, I was settling a family score. Uh, I felt it was a really important job to do and I'm really pleased that um, I'm still in touch with many of the survivors and their families who were involved in that part of this project. It felt like a huge honor then and it feels even more so now. Thank you, thank you, Natasha. Um, Ross, you live in Manchester, uh, and in some of your interviews for Refugee Voices, you have a, a personal connection to many interviewees. Tell us a little bit how you got into the oral history and how you started interviewing Holocaust survivors. All right, so, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. And thank you also for inviting me to the conference and for me to be able to meet so many people and see the boards and see the faces of people I've interviewed for you. It's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So I started um, my working career as an oral historian in Manchester. And I interviewed um, the older members of the Manchester Jewish community who were the children of immigrants who had come to Manchester from the 1880s to the 1914, interviewing them about their lives, life story collection. I was working with Bill Williams at Manchester Polytechnic, Manchester Studies Unit, Manchester Polytechnic, now Manchester Metropolitan um, University, is it? No, whatever, whatever it's called now. And, uh, and having interviewed hundreds of those elderly children of immigrants, the next step was to start interviewing the next wave of immigration, which were the refugees who came to Manchester in the 30s. And I started doing that. This was in the 1970s, so this was very early on. I've been interviewing for four, over 45 years, which is, is, seems, seems impossible. Um, and having done it, you know, the refugees, I began to go into those that came after the Second World War, which were the survivors. And you, you don't forget the first survivor interview you do. And I, it was a matter of who do I approach, where, where do I go? And my husband, um, his mum had a cousin who survived the war. And I decided I would approach her. She was a family member. The family had actually brought her and her sister over after the war. And she'd never spoken to the family. A lot of the survivors I interviewed in those days, they had never spoken to anybody about their experiences. They didn't want to burden their families. They didn't want to upset their children. But I'm coming as an outsider, although I was like, I'd married into the family, but I wasn't her children. And she was my very first interview um, with a survivor. She had hidden in the forest. She was from... Rokiskus in Lithuania. She had gone into the forests. She had been in hiding. She joined the partisans. It was an amazing interview. Amazing. Survived the war and was brought to Manchester. From then on, I was interviewing many survivors, um, not just for that project, but I went on 
to interview for many, many projects. I think that every project that's been mentioned up here, I think I've interviewed for them. <laughs> Um, so I went on, I was asked, and some have been, as you say, like top down, and some have been bottom up, because the next project I worked on um, was with the 45 Aid Society in Manchester, because this was eight, 1985, and one of their members died, and one of the younger members, and they were shocked, because he'd never recorded his story, his testimony. And they thought, you know, we can't start dying and our stories go with us to the grave. Please, and they came to me because they knew I'm interviewing Holocaust survivors, please interview us, please get down our testimonies. And so I worked with them, those that wanted to, there were some 45 aiders that did not want to be, uh, didn't want to do it, which was fine. Um, and spent a couple of years interviewing them for, for themselves. For their, it went into the Jewish Museum, but also it was for them. They wanted this done. From there, um, the National Sound Archive, they started the Living Member of the Jewish Community Project, 1997, after a conference, Maxwell Conference, and I became the Northwest um, Administrator, Coordinator and Interviewer, trained volunteers to go out and interview, and that was for the British Library. Um, and then um, you've got the Shoah Foundation, which uh, I became an interviewer for, for them, and that was very much top down. Um, I didn't actually agree with some of the things that, you know, they were very, wanted to focus very much just on the war years, they were not so interested in the before and then the after, and I was a life story historian oral historian, and I didn't listen, and I did very long interviews <laughs> for the Shoah Foundation, um, both incorporating their lives before and after the war in quite a lot of detail. Um, and then the AJR came along and uh, asked me to be an interviewer for them um, and be the Northwest administrator and interviewer. And the thing with the AJR was that they also allowed me to interview, because I was so aware that we were missing the ultra-Orthodox members of the community. I had not interviewed any of them, and I knew they existed. I knew they were there. And um, they allowed me to do that, even though these people were not members of AJR, had no connection with AJR, but AJR recognized that this was a massive gap in, in the testimonies that had been taken. And I had a friend who was a member of Maxiki Hadass, an elderly friend, and she really was my introduction to the Maxiki Hadass community and to even more ultra-Orthodox you know, communities in Manchester. And I think I must have done at least, uh, certainly over 20 of those 70 plus interviews were with ultra-Orthodox members. Um, besides that, I work on the Windermere project. Uh, you've heard of the Windermere children interviewing picture, you know, children that came to Windermere after the war and done many private commissions. Inter you know, families approaching me to um, interview their, their parents. Ros, thank you. Sorry. I think we should interview Ros about all her experiences. Um, <laughs> interviewing for different organizations and what's interesting because we both worked on the Shaw Foundation and we talked about it yesterday that we didn't listen to our instructions and did our own <laughs> interviews so that's another interesting aspect how to analyze interviews because the interviewer doesn't have to listen to the instruction given from the organization for example I interviewed my own father which wasn't allowed at all in the Shaw Foundation but I did anyway um, now let us turn to Jackie Ivan Kurt who I all had the privilege of interviewing and I think it's important for all your stories that Jack and Eva were child survivors with not, no or no memories of your own. And in Kurt's case, you came as a young teenager with clear memories of growing up in Cologne. Um, so please let us tell me, uh, I would like to ask you when you first started sharing your story and what you knew about your life at that point. And maybe Eva, we can start with you as you are the, the youngest. Okay. <laughs> My question is um, to take you back to that point when you first started sharing uh -huh. your story right. and what you knew about your own life right. when you started talking. Okay. Right. Um, well, I knew about my story from a very early age because I came here to the UK with my mother and my stepfather in 1948 when I was three. And because I... Um, 
grew up without having any grandparents, cousins around the place. I was always asking my mother about her life growing up, her school days, her hobbies, and that sort of thing. And interspersed with those very ordinary family stories, she would tell me in tiny snippets of her wartime experiences as she felt that I could cope with the details. So from, from about the age of six or seven, she started to, to, to tell me in a very small way. And because she said that I was sort of more or less like a sponge, I just kept asking her questions. So as I grew older, so the replies became more detailed. And that is why I do know my mother's story very well and in great detail, because she was also one of those survivors who was always able to talk about her experiences. And um, the way I first started uh, talking about my mother's story, uh, I, I live in Cambridge and I used to work in a further education college and some of my friends who were teachers, they knew my mother, they knew me, and they started to ask me to speak in their classes. And, uh, and then one day, no, my, my mother always said that it was after Schindler's List that I felt the urge that I should really start doing this. And uh, I happened to see, uh, I was told, I rang up the Holocaust Educational Trust and I said, could you use me as a survivor speaker? And I was told, uh, you should look in the Times Ed the following day, you will see a small advert looking for educators, people who want to be trained as educators. And to cut a long story short, I came to London, I had an interview with uh, probably Rachel and Karen, and they took me on as a survivor speaker. And that, I'm amazed to say, was back in 2000. Uh, and I worked in the office for some time as well, but uh, they gave me all the opportunities and I, I've hardly stopped talking ever since. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Eva. Um, Jackie, now, now to you, please. Um, you did not know your own history. Um, so please tell us when you discovered your past, please. Okay, well, I started talking to my wife, uh, Lita, about my past. Uh, uh, it was a total mystery, uh, and there was a per basically a, a conspiracy of silence with my family. I just wrote these little words down just to really get it out properly. I was born in the Rothschild Hospital in Vienna, Austria, in 1812-41. And what I'm about to say, I had no knowledge of. At six months old, both my mother, Elsa Spiegel, and Milliner, my father, Adolf Kampfein, a tailor, were put on a train to Malitrosinet in Minsk and were murdered. At nine months old, I was found in an orphanage and also put on a train to Theresienstadt and stayed there for two years, eight months. After a few weeks, recuperating I was flown over to the UK with 300 children and then being fostered and adopted by two wonderful people, Annie and, Janowski, Annie and Jenny Janowski, who were wonderful, uh, wonderful to me. They spoiled me silly, but unfortunately were unable to talk to me about my past. Then one day, when I was about nine years old at school, an old boy at school informed me that I was adopted and that was the first time I was informed about it. Took, went home to my mother and she explained, yes, you were. And that's as far as it went. And then I went to my adopted grandmother, who one day, just to see how she was, and she informed me I was Austrian from Vienna. And finally, the last bit of info was when I had to prove that I was Jewish so that I could get married to a wonderful girl called Lita in a synagogue, my mother showed them papers to prove my status. I grabbed them out of her hand to find out the full horror of my past. You could say I was traumatized from this information. And now, for 60 years, Lita and I have been picking up this horrible journey, picking up the pieces of the puzzle of my life. And thankfully, through DNA program, I have found out that some of my family had survived. And now I'm in touch with them for a long time. I thought I was the only one to have made it, but I'm very happy, man who, against all the odds, had a wonderful life.
Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for sharing your story. Um, Kurt, I think in your case, it was a visit to Cologne, which started uh, your, your storytelling. Um, please tell us about it. Uh, I, I, w I didn't know that I was going to have to tell my life story here. But anyway, uh, I wasn't, didn't, wasn't, didn't know that I was going to be in such an illustrious company. Anyway, I was born in Cologne in 1925. I was lucky I came here with kinder transport before the war. I was, went to the local school, the, we had a Jewish school in Cologne, the Yavne, which was a high school, which was one of the few high schools or, uh, uh, yes, high schools in West Germany. And it was pure chance, I went there and I was lucky that our headmaster or director of the school decided after Kristallnacht, one couldn't live in Germany anymore, he tried to transfer his whole school to England. And I was one of the first group. We came in January 1939, about 20 boys, 20 girls, and he brought us to England. Uh, he saved about 130 of the children of the students in his school. Did couldn't save himself or his family, and I heard you say that talked of Marley Trostenitz, which nobody has ever heard of. I don't suppose anybody here has ever heard of Marley Trostenitz. Marley Trostenitz was the largest German extermination camp in Eastern Europe, in White Russia at the time. And I was in England. My parents, who were in Cologne, were actually deported in 1942 to uh, Minsk and Mali Trostenets is a, it's, it's a, out the, on the outskirts of Minsk. And uh, they were actually murdered on arrival. They, it, it wasn't a, a work camp or, or a concentration camp. It was an extermination camp. It was purely there to murder people. So I was extremely lucky. I came here and, well, of, of, of all the boys and girls who came at that time, I think I'm only one or two of us are still around. The rest of us have gone wherever one goes in the end. So that, is, that was my beginning. And I've lived in this country all, most of my life. I spent many years in Africa. And uh, yes, we settled down here. I've, I, from time to time, I still speak to children about kinder transport. People are still interested. I don't know how much, how long, much longer they will be interested after all of us are not here anymore to talk about it. I know there's a lot of studying going on. I'm somehow I'm, I'm skeptical of people how they think about it or how they remember it or what they really care about what happened to us, our people, nearly a hundred years ago now. So apart from that, that's all I have to say for the moment anyway. Thank you, thank you, Kurt. <laughs> so so um, just switching back to Natasha and to, uh, to Ros, um, I'm sure these stories resonate with you. And I wanted to ask you which challenges uh, you experienced as an interviewer, because we know that interviews can be challenging, and whether you agree with the statement that the testimony is a co-creation, or do you see the role of the interview more as an empathetic listener? <laughs> Remember about the mic? Yeah, so challenges. There are, yeah, a number of challenges. I mean, the first really is how to deal with the traumatic content of an interview and the emotions that that evokes in, in the interviewee and how to deal with that and to be, you know, obviously prepared for that, that it might happen. Um, my way of dealing with it, because when I started interviewing, there were no guidelines, there was no, you know, this is how you do it, it was just feel your way. 
Um, and the way I dealt with it was that I, you know, gave them a little bit of space when they broke down, but I didn't let them dwell, like wallow in it. I didn't let them dwell on it too long. I found, you know, I didn't turn the recording off unless they requested it. Uh, I felt it was a very important part of the recording that, you know, these, these, the trauma had affected them in this way. Um, and I moved them on. So I would, within, you know, a minute or so, having, you know, they've taken time to compose themselves a little bit, I would then ask, you know, and what happened next? And that way they had to sort of gather their thoughts and, and move out of that traumatic memory into the next step. Um, very occasionally we were asked to turn off the recording. Um, so that was one aspect. But the other aspect is, you know, what effect did it have on the interviewer? Because as an interviewer, you're sitting, listening sometimes to the most horrific experiences. And in those days, there was never any thought that, that the interviewer might need support and might need help afterwards. And there was no support, there was no help. You went home back to your family and got on with life. Except that the most horrific incidents you know, that, that, that I listened to have stayed with me have definitely stayed with me, were seared into my memory, almost as if I've experienced those things myself. They live with me to this day. Um, and as someone said before, you know, the Elie Weasel quote that, um, you know, whoever listens to a witness becomes a witness. I feel I be have become a witness to the most horrific incidents that, that people had to face. Um, and I think it's important that projects, I mean, the, you know, the Holocaust projects are, are coming to a close as people die. But anyone that's involved with recording traumatic memory needs to, and any project doing that, needs to address the fact that interviewers need professional help and support if they feel that's necessary. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, very, that's just becoming, we're becoming more aware of it now than we ever were. And I know the Oral History Society have got something up on their website now about dealing with trauma in interviews. So this was something that I've had to live with um, and without any help. And I knew there was a point at which I knew I couldn't do Holocaust interviews. Every time I had a baby, I knew I couldn't interview a survivor because it was just too raw. It was too close. And I would wait until I felt ready to go back to Holocaust interviewing. So, yeah, the effect on the interviewer is important. And then there are other challenges, but I don't know whether you want me to stop here. <laughs> I think, we should, should Natasha, was it the same for you? How? Well, I, I can reflect much of what you have said. Um, for me, I was part of a big team um, uh, of, of, of people that were setting up these interviews, so there's a lot of preparation because the premise of the interviews that I was doing possibly similar to you, was that um, these survivors had never shared their story before. So for a lot of the survivors that I spoke to, uh, their family were understanding what had happened in their life as they were speaking for the first time. Um, but I can reflect exactly what you were saying about the trauma of the experience. I said earlier what a huge privilege it was, and I will never back down from that. It was the most enormous privilege to help a survivor share their story and much as what was said earlier on the panel that there is this sense of towards the end of life having protected one's family survivors then wanted to share the experience so that lessons were learned and could be shared going down the generations uh, but it was a very very traumatic experience uh, with the interviews that i did there was enormous amounts of tears a lot of them were mine, and I felt that if I was able to cry with a survivor, which I couldn't stop myself, to be honest, it almost gave them permission to open up as well, and so it was a hugely emotional experience. Again, um, for me, I was offered support, but I didn't want it, because I knew that the minute I started unpicking how I felt about this whole experience, I wouldn't be able to go back and finish the job, so I ended up finishing the 112 interviews um, as was set by the project and then went to a therapist and then at the end of one session she was very sweet I just cried for the whole hour and then she leant forward and said do you think you need a double session and I was like yes 
Um, but actually, the tears were really important, and I was very happy to shed them. Um, there was a real sense of responsibility, not just actually for the survivor, but also for their family, who were understanding a lot about their parent, grandparent, partner uh, for the first time as well. Um, so when you talk about co-creation, it felt like a co-creation. It was um, a deeply personal experience, again, going back to that word privilege, uh, and the importance of sharing those stories so that uh, lessons were learned. The last question I asked all of the survivors that I interviewed was, do you feel that lessons had been learned? And the most horrifying answer was given to me then, actually, which was no. Um, despite all the horror that they had shared with me, the absolute depths of humanity that they had explored in their testimony, almost the worst answer was that lessons had not been learned. We look at what's happened in Russia, with Russia and Ukraine. You know, there are so many examples again and again and again where we have not learned lessons from the past, and that, for me, was the saddest answer. Thank you. I think it's, it's very interesting, uh, the whole thing about how do you react as an interviewer when somebody starts crying. And I remember in the training with the Shah Foundation, actually, we were trained not to, to accept it. And I think that's, uh, that's the challenge, in a way, to accept it as part of the testimony without you having to comfort the survivor. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges and what you have to learn, that it's part of the interview. And as Rose said, uh, and it's the same, for example, uh, with not interrupting somebody, because we are not trained not to say, oh, yes, or, you know, and just to sit there and be the person who listens. So thank you for sharing this. Um, Eva, Kurt, and Jackie, I wanted to come back to you and ask you, how has your storytelling, talking about your life, how has that affected you, and has it helped you to accept the past? Maybe, again, let's start with Eva and then move along. That's a difficult question to answer. It's sort of like a chicken and egg question. I don't know how it's affected me. Um, no, it's really difficult. I, you know, I think like other survivors, I feel it's a duty to tell my mother's story. I feel very proud of my mother um, and all she went through three and a half years in camps uh, and having lost 95% of our family. Uh, and what she often said to me, she said that, um, yes, but they are all remembered, not just by her, but by all the hundreds of people I tell the story to. So um, it's, no, I think it's enormously enhanced my life. And my mother, she had a nice sense of humor. And she said to me once, she said, not only did I give birth to you under the most dire of circumstances, she weighed five stone when I was born. And she said, I gave you life after retirement. <laughs> Which is true. But I, notice, I notice that you say your mother's story. So well, you feel very mother's. much that you're telling your mother's story. It's, yeah, I mean, I only, you know, appeared the last uh, three weeks before we were liberated by the Americans. Um, and I don't know, but I like to think that perhaps her being pregnant gave her an extra will to live, but of course there were thousands and thousands of other women who would have been pregnant who would have felt the same. Um, but I think perhaps it, it helped her. Thank you, Eva. Kurt, what about you? You started going to Cologne uh, and have been talking in class with school children in Cologne. Yes. How has that affected you? Or has that changed your view of Germany? Or How should it affect it? Well, you want to? Oh, sorry. Um, I, I came here as a young boy. I was 13 years old. And when we first came, it was more like a school outing. We had planned, parents had planned to go to America. And they sent me here for a few months so that then we would continue. As some of our boys, in fact, did. They, stayed here a month or two or three, and then the parents, they joined their parents, went to the United States. <coughs> it didn't happen for everybody, it didn't happen for us. They, by the time their quota number, America had a restricted entry, by the time they would have gone, war had broken out, and that's, that was the end of that story. So, 
I grew up, it was a sort of gray area. It didn't happen from one day to the next. It was a slow process of being here. We were in London when war broke out. We were evacuated. I was evacuated to, to Bedford. I spoke very little English with English people. Uh, it, it was a sort of a culture shock, really. Um, it was the kind of terraced house. You open the front door, you're in the front room. There was no bathroom. Toilet was at the bottom of the garden. Uh, we had lived a normal, what was far as normal, middle class life. Uh, and suddenly to be, it, it became a very primitive, right? but a young boy gets used to these things and didn't, uh, didn't trouble me. I went to the local school. People were very nice, very kind. I've been very, very lucky from that point of view. I've always met and been with nice people. Uh, that's how it affected me. Good. What I meant is, what I meant uh, is to ask you how did talking about your experience affect you, because I know you've got a very close friend now in Cologne, who found you through the Stolpersteine outside her house, um, and that she has invited you to come back to Cologne and you talk to school children. How has that affected you? Well, Stolpersteine for me. I personally don't like them. Uh, it's as if we are walking on somebody's grave, but everybody has a different idea. Others say it's a memory. We bow down to read what it says on there. But I always felt I don't want to do it. I don't want to have a stopper's time put down because I felt that people are then walking on their graves. Rightly or wrongly, that's how I feel about it. We all have different ideas. Uh, in my, by my grandmother, who also lived in Cologne on the other side of the Rhine, yes, there are Stolpersteine there in her memory, and my uncles and aunts. We had a large family in Cologne, and all the cousins in those days, the elder, the older cousins, were all uncles and aunts. I had uncles and aunts in every part of the town, so. Uh, it's, it's, I'm still today learning about the family. Uh, somebody found a book that was published in America by the cousin of mine who had been here, and I got it the, last week or two weeks ago, and I discovered things that I hadn't known before. So we always learn, and there's more to learn about it. It's quite amazing. Well, your story is going to, is a, there is a Yavne Museum where the former school was, and Kurt's story is going to be featured quite prominently. I think we're working <coughs> on a sort of memorial walk to see where Kurt grew up and where he lived, and they've done many interviews with Kurt. Um, thank you, Kurt. But Jackie, I know for you talking is difficult. Um, yes, it is difficult. Uh, my wife is being my counselor. Um, she instigated my look into my past, and uh, uh, basically she's helped me all the way. And how was it for you? Maybe you can tell us a little bit, because you have been on television recently, and they tried to, they found your father, and yes. they tried to find family. How was that process, to be suddenly in the public eye? Difficult, but it was a process I felt I had to do, I, and by doing it, I approached by two DNA girls in New York who uh, helped me find out uh, a lot about my uh, father's side. I had only my mother's side. She failed to put my um, father uh, on the birth, my birth certificate in Vienna uh, simply because she wasn't married to him. It was during the war. He was, and I was born in 42. She, she got together in early 41, so uh, uh, she, and on top of it all, I found out I had a half-brother, uh, and my father was married previously. They both were sent, my half-brother, and um, the, uh, my mo uh, his mother went to Auschwitz and were murdered, and um, it was uh, a pretty hard story to tell. 
But Jackie, maybe you could share the story of what's interesting in your life, that actually your early life in Bulldogs Bank, when you were brought to Britain, is very well documented. Yes. Which is interesting. Just yeah. maybe just... Well, in the Wiener Library, there's some files on us, 1070, 1070 they're called. Um, the two nurses, the Dans, they were Germans, looked after us, and Bulldogs Bank, which is a funny name in Sussex, uh, where we were the first place where we basically learned English. We both obviously spoke Czech and... <coughs> Then we went to another place called Weir Courtney after a year of learning to speak English, met the older children, and then I was fostered by these lovely Jewish people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I wanted to ask Natasha and Rose whether you had the, I always find it, I've done many interviews, I find those interviews most difficult where I feel I can't connect to the interviewee. Uh, and it happens, sometimes it happens. I want to know, has it happened to you and were there instances where you had to stop an interview? When you couldn't connect, what do you mean? Um, what I mean is that for all various reasons, um, you know, the interviewer has different expectations or is angry, has an agenda or feels, you know, what you're doing is wrong or, you know, that it is, that communication is so difficult um, that you actually can't. There are other instances where you feel, yeah, you can't quite, you know, help the person tell the story. Mm. So what do you do in that case and has that happened? The only, I mean, and I did so many hundreds, but the only thing that comes to mind is where I was asked um, to do an interview with a lady and hadn't been told that she was suffering from dementia. And when I started the interview, it start, became obvious that she really was having difficulty recalling things. It was the shortest interview I'd ever done. It lasted about an hour and a quarter. I tried my best to elicit any memories that she still had. It was a very difficult interview, um, very difficult. But the family was so wanting her to do it, but it was very limited. Mm. Yeah, I guess I had a, a similar experience once, um, but I knew so much about the interviewee prior to the interview, that a little bit like you, I was able to try and lead her through the whole interview. But I just wanted to pick up on something that you said earlier on, which was, once you receive the interview, you are seared by it. Um, there is a sense of responsibility with it. There is obviously that sense of bearing witness to it. But of the interviews that I did, I think I can recall almost every word of every interview, because it was so emotional. It felt so important to do, and um, it's just amazing how you can connect so deeply with somebody in such traumatic circumstances. And so um, I can remember almost every detail of the interview ease that I had the privilege of, of speaking to um, and recall the horror that they shared with me. Um, but uh, for me, a lot of the work was done before the interview, so the interview was almost definitely not a process because that sounds like it was cold, but it was, I knew where we were going with the interview because I knew so much about the survivor before. Um, so I, knew, I had a map that I was following essentially, but actually a lot of the work for me was afterwards because I felt such a sense of responsibility, not just to the interviewer, but to their family as well, that it was really important that we followed up and that we kept in touch and that there was plenty of time before and after the interview, just to be and to be together. Um, so it was um, a very cathartic experience. And I, I mean, there were, there were many interviewees who said it was really important that they did this before they died. And I really, really hope that it was a positive experience for everybody 
um, because it would be terrible if it was um, otherwise. Thank you, Natasha, because I, it, it shows us that there are lots of bits in interviews we actually don't see. Uh, and that the scholar Noah Shanka, he talks about it. We don't see the tea breaks. We don't know what happens in between tapes. We don't know what happened after or before. Um, so. But I think, that, I think that's almost the most important bit. Um, just to, we have a duty of care when you're taking an interview, when you're re eliciting that kind of pain from a survivor. There is a duty of care before and after. Yeah, well, that's another topic. What do projects do in order to fulfill the duty of care? Um, but I think at this point, I'd just like to thank you a lot and really open the floor to questions. So we have about, yeah, 15 minutes. We need some mics, please. Thank you. First question. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, may I take my hat off um, to the whole panel, first of all to the survivors who, you know, who who've give up so much of their time to tell the, their valuable story and, and also to the interviewers who've clearly put their heart and soul into, into this work that is, is, is very impactful. But I'd like to ask, um, it, it's clear the sensitivity that's gone into gathering the testimonials and the stories of so many, but um, do the panel, and in particular the interviewers, feel that the testimonies are really being shared um, in the most impactful way? And do they have a vision for the future? And particularly once, unfortunately, the, the first generation survivors are no longer here to tell their story firsthand, um, how, how their testimonies can be shared with future generations um, and, and that in a way that has that real emotional impact and, and punch that they have. Thank you. Shall we just, I'll gather a few questions and then come back the, in the back. Thank you. Um, I just want to fill in a gap. Uh, my name is Michael Marks, I'm Kurt Marks' son. Um, he was asked um, what impact um, speaking of his story to others has had. I need to take you back a little bit. My mother spent three years in Auschwitz. Um, she was one of those survivors who could not talk about her experience. And while she was alive, my father would not talk about his either in solidarity. When she unfortunately passed away, and this was just after his first trip back to Cologne, which I went with him on with my mother, which was a miraculous because she wouldn't dream of setting foot in, in Germany after her experience and, and my wife. Um, that, I think, um, if you like, switched a light on in him. But he wasn't able to act on that until after my mother died. And after which, and after he learnt after 50 years what had happened to his own parents because the information coming out of Marley Trostanets took a devil's time to get out. Um, he became a man with a mission and he's not looked back. Um, and I think it's been a remarkable thing for him to experience the response from the children he's spoken to. Um, the, the only other comment I would make is that because of the attitude towards passing experience on to one's children um, in the 60s, which basically was not to pass it on as a matter of protection, I started to hear about these things when he started to talk about them. So I spent many, many years feeling other, um, but not really, really knowing why. Um, so, 
Thank you very much for sharing this. And I'm sure lots of second and third generation can relate to what you said. Let's now please answer the question about the, the interviews. What's your vision uh, for the testimonies? And if you have to add something, also interviewees, please add. I'm going to speak quickly because I know that there are lots of questions. Um, I wasn't here this morning, but I understand from Michael from AGR that there's a portal uh, collecting the uh, testimonies, which is absolutely critical to um, get the reach as far as possible. In terms of the interviews that I've done, um, there's still the uh, very sincere hope that they will be housed in the Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre, which is going to be built in Victoria Tower Gardens. Um, that has, you know been um, in the press a lot, been through a few stumbles, but we're still of the full belief that uh, that's where the survivor testimonies will be held. Um, that building will you know, challenge us, it's going to teach us, um, it's going to help to commemorate, it's going to remind us, and um, it's going to help to define our values, and those testimonies are absolutely critical to that end. Thank you, Ross. So, I think, you know, how they're going to be used in the future, I think this is sort of something that this conference is discussing and ways in which they can be made, you know, very essential for education of the future. I think, you know, the fact that these, these testimonies have been recorded and we're now in the digital age where they can be shared online. I think it's amazing what AJR have done with their... Um, you know, hundreds, I don't know how many is online now, but, but people can access them and listen to them. And especially also, you know, for family members. I, one of the in interviewees that I did for AJR just died two months ago. And her grandchildren went onto the AJR website during the Shiva and listened to their grandmother's testimony. And then were texting me, you know, thank you so much for doing this. You know, this is such a... It's just amazing, wonderful to be able to listen to our grandmother speaking and sharing what she went through. So it's a legacy for the families, it's, and it's, an, it's an, an, an education tool for the future. And being able to share that online and that people have access, but also monitoring that it's going to be used in the correct way. I think that's where the problem will be that it's got to be used correctly and there's got to be the monitoring and the safeguards for information to be used, out, not out of context. So. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add something, Eva? Or... No. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I just want to respond briefly as well. I think the challenge is really the, the huge quantity and that there are, you know, if you have a three or four hours interview, that's a long interview to find what you're looking for. But maybe there will be the technology in the future which will make that much easier and have transcripts available and link, have metadata so that you can find certain ways um, to access bits of interviews. Um, that's what we're here for and that's what we have to develop. Any other questions? Yes, please. Mike. Okay, Shinsi is there. You first and then you. Yes, Ruth, please. Um, I came over on the kinder transport, and um, it's always been a part of my being knowing that the country of my birth actually wanted me dead. And that is quite something to live with. And I think a lot of us who came over do live with it. Um, what I want to talk about is that this sort of thing can't happen without... Um, the community turning a blind eye or condoning it. And we're in danger of doing this again with the Uyghurs. They are Muslims in the wrong uh, religion country, the Han Chinese. And uh, the whole awful story could be repeated again unless enough people call out um, and when people do simply call out and stage their, uh, announce their objections, um, it will help to make it much, much harder for the perpetrators go, to go ahead. They always start in a very small way, selecting a few to kill off and seeing whether there's any resistance. And there wasn't the resistance when they started on the Jews. Jew hatred was wide enough and deep enough for them to go ahead. Um, 
let's not let it happen again with the Uyghurs in China. Thank you, Ruth. There's a question over here, please. Just come here. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. Um, so the, all of the testimonies, are they in the main in English? Um, because, for example, there's three people here on the panel who have connections to Belarus, and I work in Belarus, where people are want to know about this, and they need to hear about this. So how do we get some of these testimonies into Russian, Belarusian? Just putting it out there. Yeah, well... <laughs> So our Refugee Voices interviews are in English. Uh, they could be in German, but nobody wanted to... Uh, actually, nobody wanted to be interviewed in any other language. I think, again, technology can help. You can subtitle things today easily um, and make them accessible in many different languages. Next job to be done. That's a job to be done, yeah. But at the moment, Refugee Voices interviews are mostly in English, but with other languages in it. <laughs> Thank you. Gabi, pass the... Thank you to all the panelists for their contributions. Uh, and Beya, I wanted to ask you, I know that uh, you are interviewing the second generation now for uh, the Refugee Voices Project, uh, but to what extent is that linked, are those testimonies linked to the testimonies of the first generation? And in particular, uh, as, as you know, I specialize in the transgenerational effects uh, to uh, amplify the first generation testimonies because often uh, the, uh, the psychological processing uh, only comes to light, the uh, processing by the first generation, if you interview the second generation. Mm. Uh, because then you get a fuller picture. Yeah. I'm not saying a full picture, but... Yes, thank you, Gabi. A very interesting question. So in an ideal world, would we now go and try to interview the first and second, the second and third generation of our interviewees, which will be interesting. I think our priority at the moment is still the first generation. Uh, and the second generation we've interviewed is not necessarily related to uh, the, the first generation. So mostly we have interviewed some people who... It, not systematically, because we can't take that on at the moment. Maybe in the future um, we can venture. And like, you know, your perspective was really interesting to add to your father's story. So I think it would be a fantastic project to do that. But at the moment, we're not doing it. Thank you. Um, as an oral historian and someone who does the interviews, I'm really curious, um, Ava Curtin, Jackie, if you could speak to moments that stand out to you from your interviews or, you know, questions that maybe surprised you or, or things you didn't expect about the interview process. Yeah, I'll repeat that. Have you got any things which stand out when you think of the times you've been interviewed? Are there any particular questions which you like or were you unexpected questions? I think all the questions was very pertinent because, as I say, for the from the time I was fostered and adopted by my parents, I, there was a conspiracy and silence until I got married. So when people came along eventually to ask me my past, I was only too e uh, eager to tell them. Uh, it wasn't easy, but I did it. And, I, I, and it was part of the healing. I think it's cathartic to yeah. do just that. Thank you. Eva, from your point of view, is there any questions or is there any, have you had any experience where somebody asked a, a bad question? Have you had experiences of that kind where you thought, oh my God, how can anyone ask me that? Uh, not really. Uh, what I would like to mention though, uh, that when my mother was interviewed for a, a BBC documentary, um, you were asking about the impact on the interviewers. Well, I have to tell you that, you know, they were with us for five days and we kept having to stop for the interviews and the cameraman. My mother just carried on. But, uh, um, no, I have to say that when I've been interviewed, um, it's always 
This might sound strange, but it's always been an enjoyable experience. I, I obviously, I hope it's obvious. I like talking about my mother. Um, I've only ha ever had one uh, one time when there was a denier in the audience, and it was a student, and uh, but he wasn't listening to anything I said. I mean, he, the, the remark he made was. Uh, there were no gas chambers outside of Poland. And I said, there were. And he said, there weren't. And I could see that he, was, he obviously was from Eastern Europe because of his accent. Nobody knew who he was. Uh, and in the end, all I could say was, you know, next question, because there was no answer to him, because there was just no way I could convince him. Uh, but that, that's the only bad experience. Where, well, you might like... Once um, I, I was asked a question in a school, I think it was in Swindon, a young boy, I mean, I don't speak to children younger than uh, 13 or 14, and this was a very young 13-year-old boy, and he said to me, what would you say if you met Hitler, right? And I said, why? And he thought I was asking him why he was asking the question. I said, no, I would ask, why? Thank you. Time for just a few other questions on the other side. Yeah, okay. Somebody has been waiting for a long time. Just at the very back. Um. I, I must admit, I had to admit a, miss a couple of minutes, so I hope this question wasn't already answered, um, and if so, I apologise. But um, I think especially for people who are, being, who are giving their testimony for the first time, I can imagine the next day or two, they might suddenly think, ah, oh, why didn't I say that? Why didn't they ask this? So I just wonder whether, how you, if, if there's a way in which you try to incorporate that into the way in which you do things, to, to pick up all of those extra... Um, t testimony aspects. We've all done interviews, haven't we? We thought, damn it, I wish I'd said that. Um, personally, at the end of every interview, I asked the family if there was anything else that we had missed, and also the interviewer. But, you know, hopefully there's an open line of, of communication and dialogue. Uh, but you're never going to be able to capture everything, but it's mainly about the essence and uh, recording as much of a memory as possible. Um, a number of my interviews were done um, not just on one occasion, but on multiple occasions. So there was always the chance when I went back the second time, the third time, for interviewees to add to what they'd already told me, um, which they did. Yeah. But you can't get everything. <laughs> I, th I think this is a, it's a good question, um, because sometimes you have to acknowledge that you actually ch can't change the recording you know, we're doing digital recording. I cannot change the clip. The only thing, for example, if somebody regrets something they've said, which also happens, um, that you edit it out, but you cannot change the original recording. So, you know, I had instances where somebody said, oh, I said something which I didn't want to say. You know, and then you have a question. And if, if somebody wants to add something um, in terms of photographs, they can send it. But as Ross said, sometimes it, the interview is more than once, and then there is a big opportunity, but I think we need to understand that each interview is given at a specific point, and it's a conversation between two people at a given time. Mm. We have time for two more questions, one over there, and then one over here. Thanks. This is a question for those who've conducted interviews, and the answer may be a simple no. Um, but I was wondering if any of you have interviewed um, perhaps family members or close friends who survived together. Have you, you know, interviewed in more than one individual who survived the same camp or circumstance? And if so, what dimension that might have added to your own insight? So, I mean, all the interviews I did were with one person at a time. Um, never interviewed two people together, if that's what you meant. No. 
Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, I interview people that came from the same places, came from Lodge, came from Warsaw, came from... Um, but they all have their own, own story to tell. Um, they, you know, I, the first family member I interviewed, she had survived with her sister, but her sister lived in, in America, uh, went to Israel. Um, so I didn't interview the sister. Um, but each one, you know, oral history, it's, it's, it's a subjected, rea subjective reality. So each person has their own story. Yes, they were, came from the same place. They may have been in the same camps. They may have gone through a, a similar experience, but they experienced it in their own way. Um, each, each interview adds another dimension, really, to the picture. Um, but um, they all stand on their own as well. They all stand on their own as, as you know, personal testimony. Um, well, I, I just want to add, yeah, the, the, I think the methodology for our history is that you interview one person uh, and give them space. I have done an interview with, uh, for example, with Margaret Hodge, Labour MP, who, you know, was actually a German refugee, her parents, but ended up in Egypt, and she only wanted to be interviewed with her sister and a friend. Mm -hmm. And that changes the dynamics if you have a group interview. It can be really good, but then you, it's more filming a conversation between people rather than conducting a life history or history interview. My question. Eva? In answer to your question, when my mother was interviewed for the Shoah Foundation and also for the BBC interview, uh, she always wanted me with her, mainly because she said, sorry, sorry, uh, yeah, for the, the BBC interview and the Shoah uh, Foundation interview, my mother always wanted her with me because she said, she said, well, you remember the things I've forgotten. <laughs> Which is true. I mean, you know, I, I would say, but you haven't said this and you haven't said that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, one last question over there and then we... Um, I just wanted to say again, thank you um, to the panel. Um, as a mother of two rather revolting at the moment uh, teenagers um, whose lives seem to surround um, Netflix and TikTok, just going back to the news that was announced today of the uh, testimonial portal that's going to be launched, there's obviously a huge amount of very emotive material and I know the focus is on ensuring the next generation is able to take that material, to learn from it and to pass it on. Are there any ideas or suggestions on how we in engage with a very kind of digital, sometimes disillusioned um, generation of, of teens whose perhaps one and only experience might be, for example, going to Poland on a school trip that they do it once and then it, that, that, that's it for them. I'm just interested how you feel the portal might be used to engage. I have uh, two teenagers. Um, I don't know whether or not I would call them revolting. Sometimes they might be, but um, I, I get the Netflix, TikTok uh, scenario. Um, one of them is very interested in oral history and one less so. I try to make it relevant for them because there is so much news of hate crimes in the media. And for me, I use that as a route into history. Um, the lessons that we should have learned at, in the Holocaust and with some of the uh, discussion that we've had today are incredibly relevant to what we are witnessing on our own streets. And um, that for me is the route into this for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Jackie, I think you wanted to say something and then we have to finish. I was just discussion. going to say that the stuff I couldn't say today too easily because of my emotional hiccups. I, I said, uh, if you go to Google and just put Jackie Young Holocaust, it tells you the whole horrible story. Can I say, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Everybody in this room is so full of admiration for all of you. And for me, again, going back to the interviews, sometimes the silence 
said absolutely everything that needed to be said. So I think you spoke through your silence today incredibly eloquently, and I think you've touched all of us, as the rest of you have yeah. too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Natasha Kaplinski. Now we can break for tea and we'll be back at uh, quarter to five, please. Yeah.